Well, um, welcome everyone. Uh, just want to uh, take a minute here and introduce ourselves as we get started on this uh, conversation around conflict in the church. Glad that you could uh, join us here today. Um, Chris, let me ask you to just go ahead and introduce yourself and then sure. I'll take it. Uh, my name is Chris Weichman. I'm the senior pastor at First Presbyterian Church of the Covenant in Erie, Pennsylvania. And I've been there, it'll be four years, uh, May 1st. So I graduated from Pittsburgh Seminary in 1998. So I'm coming up on 24 years of completed ministry, which is hard, hard to believe. believe. So, yeah, so I bounced around. I've been an associate for about 10 of my first 24 years and then a solo pastor and now a head of staff. So that's me in a nutshell. Nice, I remember being at your graduation, man. That that's funny? right. Yeah, I, re I remember you being Mark and I used to work together for those of you who don't know us. So yes, we worked together. Yes, we worked together a long time ago. Yeah. And um, Whiteman and I have been in in settings. That's for a different phone call, but we have found <laughs> <That's> our, <right. laughs> we have found ourselves in some strange spaces. Um, very true. My name is Mark Witzel. I'm the lead pastor at Pleasant Hills Community Presbyterian Church. Uh, just south of Pittsburgh. Uh, I've been here for almost 10 years oh and um, graduated from Pittsburgh Seminary in 2004 and then graduated again uh, in 2000 something late teens or something uh, where I finished up my D-min. Um, and yeah, it's been a, just a, a good ride, uh, both in terms of school and in terms of the churches. Yeah. I have just been really blessed to serve some uh, wonderful churches, yeah. um, and maybe that's just a good place to start, yeah. in as much yeah. as I would say that I have served some really wonderful churches, but there have been none of them that have been conflict-free. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so Fancy uh, that. Well, I know that may come as a surprise <laughs> to so many of you, um, but uh yeah, in as much as uh, you may be on here today, just in a, a state or a season of conflict in your own ministry, just take some encouragement in that. Um, I find myself right now actually uh, fairly conflict free in church life, but that takes a phone call or or an email to yeah. just shift flip that thing upside down, uh, and that happens with some frequency. And um, what we wanted to do here today was just take a little bit of time uh, to talk about that, maybe a few lessons that uh, that Chris and I have learned along the way, um, and um, yeah, some things that we've gleaned from uh, some years of ministry, and in as much as it can be of help to you, um, and uh, yeah, we just kind of offer up a, a little friend-to-friend -friend conversation here. Um, Chris, maybe I'll start off with the, just kind of a softball question for you on this issue of conflict. Sure. Um, when you, through the years, where have you seen those um, kind of uh, pinch points in church life? Like, where are the, yeah. the places where you have seen uh, kind of increased friction uh, in terms of conflict in church life? Yeah, it was, um, to me, it's more uh, a circumstance. So yep. uh, particularly around expectations. Uh, um, when that comes to uh, expectations of what the pastoral role is, and that can include uh, obviously pastoral care, that can include leadership. Um, so I think expectations and then um, sort of a, a, this sense of uh, power or control. Mm. Um, and so, and that can, I mean, those circumstances are in every aspect of the life of the congregation. Pastoral care, worship, leadership, Christian education, um, dealing with change. And so those have been the areas. So those have been really the circumstances that I've really sort of, as I look back on, as we were preparing for this, sort of looking back at the various conflicts over 24 years of ministry, have really been revolved around certain sorts of circumstances, expectations, and a sense of power or control in some form or another, whether it's mine or an individual's. And um, so th those have been the key areas for me um, as I think about it. So that's that's probably a good summation uh, yeah. as I think about that. Yeah, as I was thinking about this question, I thought um, 
like uh, those seasons of change in church life, whether those are like kind of pop popped on us uh, because yeah. of some circumstance or yeah. whether, or maybe even more so like those seasons of intentional change. Cause I think yeah. like people have a level of patience when it's like, yeah. well, we get it. This yeah. is this such and such has happened and we have yeah. to adjust. Yeah. Even still, there are some people who can like there's some conflict can yeah. arise. Yeah. But, but when when leadership takes an intentional like turn yeah. or shift, I, I find that's really when yeah. we have uh, I've experienced uh, conflict in ministry. Yeah. And and those have been some of the hard ones, because some of that conflict has been like, uh, frankly, some of it's just gone unresolved. Um, yeah, and it, that's right. Right. And sometimes it's not for lack of trying. It's just yeah. it just it just doesn't get yeah. resolved. You know, just thinking about the circumstances over the past two years, right? I know, mm -hmm. you know, if we, we've talked a couple times a year, at least maybe, and thinking about all the change that has been thrust upon us by COVID right. and things that we probably should have addressed five or 10 years ago um, and probably would have taken at least a year to move forward on, literally resolved themselves in a week with everybody on the same page. Right. And so uh, pretty much on the same page. Let's put it yeah. that way. Yep. Um, you know, had that had this been, you know, uh, something that was not required or necessary, it would have taken a lot longer and there probably would have been a little bit more conflict along the way. Um, I think that's a really good observation because, um, you know, when we're intentionally um, turning the ship a little bit uh, in a different direction, um, because we feel that's how the spirit's leading us as staff or the session. Um, that tends to be a little bit more prone to different types of conflict. I think. Yeah, totally agree. Um, I think your your observation about expectations is is definitely uh, yeah. on point. Um, pastoral care, we've actually started to name it uh, congregational care in an attempt yeah. to say, listen, this is a work of the whole body. Yep. Um, move. Uh, but that is one area through the years, and I think in some ways I I can. Uh, I can understand it to a degree in that expectations have have been built, I think, through generations, frankly, that like the pastor is the the hand holder through, yep. through difficulties in life. And I don't want to kick that to the curb, but it is to say I my own sense of it is, is that's a work of the whole body, not yeah. only for pastors. Agreed. And so sometimes those kind of spaces have been some conflict. You know, I I didn't get a phone call every week or. Uh, or, you know, um, I had a scenario here uh, some years back where, um, you know, it, it kind of took the Facebook because, you know, my uh, loved one is in the hospital and, um, you know, they didn't get a visit. And um, meanwhile, interestingly enough, this, is, this was so good. I know what you're going to say. I'm ready. Yeah. Interestingly <laughs> enough, at the exact time that the post was posted, I was in the hospital room. I, you know, it's like, <laughs> well, that's kind of yeah. a weird moment. And and I, again, I try to be patient with that because I, I understand people are very sensitive about loved ones, especially when they're Absolutely. in a, a raw space. But um uh, you know, that was one where we had to kind of just have a direct kind of like, hey, yeah. here's here's the truth of the matter and kind of unpack it for people. Yeah. I have found that anything, um, you know, anything that involves uh, technology seems to be ripe for conflict. Um, you know, like there's something about being be uh, behind a screen that allows me to say or behave in ways that I probably would never do if Absolutely. I were in your presence. Yeah. Um, and that is just really, uh, whether that's emails that get sent, emails are interesting. Um, uh, yeah, I, the, the emails yeah. I have received through the years are really, yeah. I think about previous generations of pastors when email was not a thing and think yeah. like, well, that would have been amazing. <laughs> Yeah, um right. or texting but, uh, even. Yeah. yes right social media is the other thing i don't do a ton yeah. of social media personally yeah. uh and it's actually in part for this reason yeah um because i end up dealing with a lot of actually a lot of dynamics almost in people's individual lives not even like a church kind of thing but where they've gotten beat up with social media or something yep. 
crazy plays out in their lives as a yep. result of social media. So I actually am kind of social media light. I know not everyone is and everybody makes their own decisions, but I find a lot of conflict kind of crops up there too. Yeah, there's, you know, texting and instant messaging and email and that, that's ripe for misinterpretation. And so, um, you know, I find, yeah, there's certain things I can email and it's really no big deal. Um, but there's some things you just have to do face to face or over the phone. And yeah. Because you read this message, like I could read into this if I really wanted to, um, but I probably shouldn't. I need to talk to this person. And yeah. so, um, so I just avoid that if I have to. And, um, you know, I have, I do a little social media personally, Yeah. but, um, but I, if they, if they somehow contact me by a social media, I say, you need to call me on my cell phone or call me in the office. I that's good. By a social media. Yeah. I think that's just maybe a good, like first point. I, I don't know that we really have like a list of, of points to, to offer up here, but that's yeah. a, that's a really, that is a good point, which is like just the redirect thing, yeah. man. I, I cannot tell you, I didn't get this, uh, in seminary, uh, but this is just learned through experience, which is like, you just, as a pastor, I feel like you have to just own like the authority to redirect people. You absolutely, you, absolutely, you can't like, cause they're happy to redirect you and your yep. work and your yep. time investment and everything else yep. when they're hot about something. And yeah. so there are times, even in the heat of it, that the redirect and you just kind of stake out your boundaries yeah. and, um, and go from there. Um, yep. yeah, that's a, a really, uh, a really good, uh, good point. Um, uh, some of these other things, you know, um, reflecting on like kind of theological basis, um, in terms of dealing with conflict, yeah. uh, uh, you know, it's kind of like, sometimes I think like we kind of miss this about mm. conflict. Cause we talk yeah. about, I think we've kind of adopted a lot of psychological or, or like therapeutic language to it. Sure. Yep. And kind of forget some of the grounding of our faith, which is like, yeah, hey, shouldn't it surprise it uh, that um, that there's conflict in the church? We love conflict, like by <laughs> <laughs> as you know, I mean, like truly, it's like as a result of the fall. Yeah, of course, there's sure. conflict in the church. We, yeah. we there's something within us uh, that, in as much as like, I don't know, I I almost think in my own kind of makeup is like there are like multiple layers. There's kind of like the heart lay, layer, which is like, mm. yep, fallen. And so I can get into conflict as, as much as anyone. And yet then the secondary level, which is like the surface level is like, I tend to be like a conflict avoider, like sure. at least like that's kind of my first kind yep. of like reaction. And so I really had to work um, hard through the years to yep. step into dealing with conflict head on. Yep. I'm um, in the same way. I mean, I, I don't think we're really you know, uh, you know, coming out of seminary is not going to teach you to deal with conflict. Um, right. So, you know, it's part of, it's a personal maturity. Yes. Um, and the first time you get that call or that email, it's like, well, you know, the wrong thing to do is to avoid it. You gotta, yep. you gotta meet it. And so yep. if you let, if you avoid it, it festers and then it's nothing but trouble, nothing good comes of that. And so yep. you got to come face to face with it deal with it honestly if it's your own mistake right you got to own it and um you own that and you apologize and and generally I, you know i found that I, I think i think it's really important i think one of the things i found when it came with conflict that arises because i did something dumb or neglected yeah. something is um to own it um to apologize for it and then i find that um people are you know, 99% of the time more than willing to accept my apology. And I, and I think part of that is because, you know, over the years, I, I, I had something crop up not earlier this week. And um, we had a meeting and we heard a report from the properties committee, the session, the trustees completely jumped over the deacons, written on my agenda, completely skipped over it. The meeting kept moving and it ended without the deacon saying something. Didn't even think about it till the next morning when an email comes from the head of the deacons who's in another state on vacation, who gets an email from one of the deacons who was present, you know, yes. and says, I can't believe 
Pastor Chris skipped over us. They don't value our ministry, yada, yada, yada. Right. So, right? Yep. They don't think we're important. So I sent out the email apologizing to the deacons and meet with a person who wrote the original email to the head of the deacons. And, you know, she was upset and I totally get that. And I apologize for it. And, you know, and I said to her, I mean, you've known me for five years. You know, I did your husband's funeral. I visited you numerous times after your husband passed. Do you really think right. that I intentionally neglected the deacons? Because of course you didn't. I said, we're, we all make mistakes and we came to that conclusion. So, yep. so part of the reason I think that people are willing to forgive and give you latitude is because they know you care about them. Yep. Um, you know, you know, you're not just someone who locks themselves in your office. And you don't see anybody ever. You don't deal with people. And so, right. so we gain a lot of pastoral clout in our work with people on a day-to-day, month-to-month, year-to-year basis. And, and a lot of times people are very gracious and give us latitude. I mean, we deal with, I deal with, we have a membership of 400 plus people and um, it's a lot to track. So, you know, it's, um, you got to own your own mistakes. Right. And and as well as others have to own their mistakes and you have to be willing yeah. to to forgive and move on. So, yeah, I think that they running I, I, as I've watched pastors through the years, the conflict avoidance thing. I, I think there's a thing about it. I, yep. I've, I've wondered this. Is it because there tends to be, I think, at least like in our tradition or neck of the woods or I, I don't know yeah. uh, how I would want to characterize it, but there seems to be this thing that a lot of kind of uh, what compassionate uh, people mm-hmm. uh, or people who understand themselves is gifted that way, get into ministry. Yeah. And, and with that comes some, I think some conflict avoidance tendencies Agreed. sometimes. And yeah. uh, as I said, that's not, uh, I got a measure of that in my, uh, my own life. Um, and like the, the initial reaction is kind of to flee from conflict. Ironically enough, I think it, that in of itself is like a form of like, adding to the conflict um because the conflict's not going to evaporate that's you know? right um and to your point um when you do hit it and own it name it offer up some apologies and forgiveness and the whole ball of wax that builds some credibility likewise right. if you run from it that also starts to to be like the the ball of snow rolling down a hill yeah. of like gaining some steam over years and yeah. i have wondered often how much does that unresolved conflict result in you know we always read these like stories or surveys like well the latest thing says pastors the average pastor is t- two years long you know it's like yeah. two years holy moly i you know i had like <laughs> a quarter of the names down after two years I, exactly so i feel like there is something about um uh, uh handling this well that does tend to yeah. make for longer ministry uh yeah. in, in one place with one people every every pastor friend that i've had over the years or you know pastors that i've known that have gotten into conflict and something really just heats up in the church and sometimes it's healed other times it just it comes to a separation i can't i don't recall any sir any one of those circumstances where there wasn't conflict avoidance yeah and so um so the fact is, man, no one likes to run into the fire, but sometimes you got to run into the fire. I mean, you got to run into the fire. Yeah, for yeah, for sure. Uh, oddly enough, I um, for a while here, I think I've been here. I know I've been here long enough, I think, to, to build the credibility. Sure. But but after I had kind of gotten up over like what I kind of dubbed the like a honeymoon phase, we talked sure. about church ministry, which I don't know. How long is that now? A week and a half or something? <laughs> <laughs> Um, but whatever that initial kind of place was, then once I started getting uh, deep enough that I was dealing with some conflict early on, I kind of had this reputation of like, man, this guy l- loves running <laughs> into the fire. Yeah. Like, and so it was kind of this, this weird thing. It was almost like he loves conflict, not because yeah. I was creating it, but he just yeah. loved. And I'm like, I hate conflict, yeah. but I'm just so painfully aware like of how much it hurts and it, it wars against us. If we don't deal with it, exactly. I've been at it, I've been at it long enough to know it. it's not going anywhere. That's right. So if we don't handle it, it's just going to be nipping at our heels for weeks, months, yep. years to come. It will not get better on its no. own. 
Yeah, it won't. I, you know, funny story years ago, um, uh, had this whole, uh, this is, this is my elder tackling story. Okay. okay. I have, I have the story of chapter when three I, in your autobiography. In chapter, yes. This would be chapter three, the day I tackled one of my elders. Um, I was, um, uh, on this uh, uh, project years ago uh, that was away from the church, we're, we're undertaking this project, and, and part of this particular day of work uh, involved uh, another organization, and the organization wasn't exactly lined with where we were coming uh, at things in terms of uh, faith, um, and I don't know, my own sense was, and I, you know, when we were doing our work years past, we would often be working alongside of people who, who were divergent. Yeah. Beliefs, different theological perspectives, theological perspectives, sometimes non-believer, wh- however you want to talk about uh, this dynamic. Um, and uh, that was the case on this given day. And I had several elders with me uh, on that day. And one of my elders was just not having this and yeah. started to get just like a little prickly about it. And they're in like we're getting some bank shot comments, yeah, here or there. And pretty soon, one of the individuals from this other group was like decided they weren't having it. So, yeah. so, so now I'm watching, <laughs> I'm watching one of I'm my visualizing elders, this in my brain. <laughs> I'm watching one of my elders. To, and so, pretty soon, I'm like, listen, listen, come on, both of you, like, I need you to come with me. And I, yeah. and I did, I was like, uh, I was actually kind of like, it was the tone I use with my, you know, seven year old now, yeah, right. it was like, no, we don't do this. Let's go. And yeah. so I pulled them out and they knew it was uh, frankly kind of treating them like children, but they were acting like children at that point. Yeah. I pulled them away and I sat them down and I'm like, what guys, like, come on, like, regardless yeah. of what we, where we're about, uh, yeah. where we are here, we got to work together the rest of the day. We have a few hours left on this project. Da, 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 da. Well, <clears throat> it was fine. We pretty much had the thing resolved. Nobody had said like, sorry, or it's fine yeah. or, or anything. Yeah. There was no kind of recon- uh, reconciliation language yet. And my elder again was like, made another like biting remark. Yeah. And, and this guy who was probably, I'd put him maybe 30 years younger. Yeah, stood up in like was was like kind of over top of them. Yeah. And at this point, my elder stands up and they're now ch- <laughs> they're now chest to chest. Yeah. I'm like, guys, in the spirit down. of the Lord. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> God, you know, I'm like, guys, sit down. Nobody was at this point. They're not even hearing me. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm not even I'm not there at this point. Yeah. They're ready to go fisticuffs. And at that point, I thought, I like I have to end this somehow. Yeah. And my only alternative left was to dive into my elder and put them on the ground because it was either going to be me doing something like that, yeah. or this guy was ready to start swinging. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I look back on that. Mo- I look back on that moment, and and it just it it so illustrates just in. Again, that's using yeah. these two guys as like the example in some ways, but yeah. it does illustrate this thing. Once we get locked into conflict, it can be easy to kind of get into that like chest to chest kind of thing where it's like this it ramps just up. elevates and you are not even aware of all the ramifications yeah. for everyone else. Yeah. And that's where the conflict avoider thing is yeah. really not healthy for church yeah. because it does, um, it does, it always has ripple effects ramifications for the rest of the body yeah you know as you were talking i was thinking i've never had to tackle an elder so i'm very grateful well if you need if you need some like coaching i'm (laughs) okay thanks um you know i was thinking about uh what i I call it the spiritual power play and um a certain you know at a certain point in ministry we were we were doing some construction and building this youth area underneath the fellowship hall. It was big and it was really nice. And, um, you know, there's the decorating committee. I'm always, I'm always fearful of decorating committees, but the decorating yes. committee. Yes. yes. And um, so we're looking for chairs down there for those, like this little cafe setup. They had booths and stuff and we're going to buy these chairs. And um, 
couldn't find any, couldn't find any. And then uh, lo and behold, one of the committee comes back and said, I found the chairs and I bought them. Oh, wow. You know, God, quote, God led me to these chairs. Okay. All right, let's check them out. <laughs> Go downstairs, open up there, the hid most hideous things you'd ever seen in your life. Didn't fit. They're going to tear up the carpet. You, there's a million reasons not to like these chairs. There's really no reason not to love them. Yeah. Or there was yeah. no reason to love them. So, so she opens them up and we're all sort of standing there dumbfounded looking at these horrible things, right? And, um, and I realized, you know, she had pulled this spiritual power play. God led me to these chairs. In other words, if you challenge me on these chairs, you're challenging God on these chairs, right? Yeah, that's right. You know, so God led me to these. Yep. And so we hemmed and hawed around and no one wanted to say anything uh, inappropriate or hurt her feelings. And so I remember I was young. I had only been in ministry a couple of years. And it was, it was simply by divine intervention, I think, that I came up with what I came up with. And I pulled her aside and said, well, I understand you think God led you to these chairs. Um, God hasn't told me or anyone else about these chairs. So let's sit down and talk about them. Um, and so, you know, this idea that, you know, uh, I mean, it's, it's really a power play. Don't challenge me on this because yep. God told me this. Well, I mean, just as a good reform type and certainly as a Presbyterian, you know, our discernment process is always never just an individual person, but it is a group. Yeah. And so um, it was really that that was a really interesting conflict where it was yep. like, well, God might, you know, you might think God will led you to him, but I don't think God spoke to me or the other 10 people who were sitting down here looking at them and not wanting to say anything bad. Um, yeah. I think that's really good because, I mean, one, it's a reminder like, hey, listen, um, God's spirit may uh, may speak to me in the yeah. same way that you believe yeah. God's spirit is speaking to you. But I also think it's a good reminder for us to make sure that we don't wield that kind of language over people. That's right. like the flip of it, you know, because if you burn it, again, it just undercuts your credibility. If you're if you leverage that kind of language with people yeah. whenever you're in conflict, yep. it just it it. It's worse. It gets worse because even if it looks appears that the conflict's resolved, I'm totally convinced they remember that and they just, I don't know, there's a certain hubris in it or something. Yeah. I, it does get worse. It gets yeah. worse. That's really. Uh, yeah. And, I, you know, I think one of the things that's important I, is the idea that as pastors, we have folks in our life, you know, not just family, but folks in the church that we have almost like a, 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 a different sort of relationship with in the fact that they can come up to me and say, you know, you're being dumb here. Yes. <laughs> you, know, yep. you are not seeing the bigger picture. Yeah. And I'm telling you because I love you, not because I want to yep. be a jerk. And so yep. you need to put the brakes on for a second and listen to what people are saying. Um, yeah. And so that's really important. You have to have the humility to, to be able to do that, to listen to that. Yeah, I've tried to, uh, I, you know, in church life here, I've always tried to talk about that as truth tellers. Um, and I have tried, I, well, I haven't tried. I actually, I have done this very directly. I have uh, a couple colleagues who I've, I have had the conversation with them, something to the effect of like, listen, at any point, I, am, I trust you. Yeah. You, know, you love me. Uh, and I know you love me enough to like, see me, my best and worst, love me in both. Yeah. But when I, when you are seeing something, you have license to come yeah. name it with me. Yeah. We'll, you come in, we'll pull the door. It's you and me. Yeah. And I, you have my commitment. I'll do my best to not be salty about it or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I try and uh, I, I have through the years found such value in licensing a couple people who I work yep. closely with to stand in that space of when it needs to be named to yeah. name the painful truth. And I've, and I've tried to, I've preached on this a few times through the years um, uh, here at Pleasant Hills church about just the necessity. I think it's healthy for us all to have just the yeah. truth tellers in our lives. Like who can tell you the truth? Yeah. Can you, whether you're leading or whatever yeah. role you are in, uh, in life, yeah. it's just, you need people who can yeah. speak the truth to you. Mark, do you, do you outline with your staff or with your session or other boards, 
like um, guidelines for dealing with conflict? Um, good question. Some years ago, uh, I um, put together what I, I think this was right after I got here. Um, during the years leading up to my arrival here, there had just been a lot of up, down, and around the bend uh, with the church in transition, as is the case often with churches between long-term pastorates. Sure. And um, so I preached on uh, conflict, I remember early on, like two, it was just like a back-to-back, -back, two weeks in a row. Yeah. Um, and I tried to cover some principles in that. And I actually got such good feedback at the time, um, uh, which isn't always the case, but uh, <laughs> this particular uh, sermon, they really kind of resonated with people. Um, yeah. And so I actually did craft what I, at the time, kind of dubbed ground rules. We've just kind of kept that language through the years. Um, uh, I have to keep them here on the wall in my office here. So here they are. Um, as the body of Christ, we will, one, commit ourselves to dealing directly with one another in criticism, conflict, and concern. Yeah. And I have Matthew 18 down as my kind of scripture place to pull from with that. As the body of Christ, we will, two, address malicious criticism out of, as out of place within the life of the church, encouraging people to handle their disagreements in a direct God-honoring way with one another. And I had Psalm 16. Uh, verse 28 down for that number three uh, as the body of christ we will avoid gossip and instead choose to use our mouths to build one another up um, from first thessalonians 5 and the last one i have down is as the body of christ we will respect follow and encourage our leaders seeking to make church leadership a joy knowing that they will someday give an account of their leadership to god uh, and i had that a uh, verse from Hebrews 13 for that. Um, and I wanted to kind of tie them all directly to a scripture. I thought we're talking about conflict. I don't want people thinking yeah. this is like, again, kind of yeah. um, therapy 101 from yeah. a pastor's point of view or something. I wanted to have it some grounding in scripture. And I do think that scripture equips us with some good ways to just handle this, you know, a lot. I do really like that Matthew 18 passage where there's a certain sense of like, go to the person go to the person with yeah. someone, elevate it there. I mean, it's pretty systematized and yeah. I, it's helpful. Yeah. Do you guys do anything along? Yeah. Those I mean, it's very similar. And I, I have one for myself that I include in there, you know, something sort of out of the ordinary malicious seems to happen. Um, I, I don't, I don't want to assume the worst case scenario right out yeah. of the gate. Yep. And what I've found a couple times and more than a couple, maybe a couple dozen times mm -hmm. over 20 some years is, Often when there's some sort of malicious strike at somebody, there's something going on under the surface. Um, yep. There's fun with a kid, the child, a grandchild, a spouse, um, financial issues. There's often there's something underneath the surface that's happening and it takes yeah. a while to get there and you got to be trusted by them to get to that place. Yep. And so um, sometimes it's just not... The presenting issue isn't it. Craig Barnes was famous for saying the presenting issue isn't the issue. What's the yep. issue is behind that. And so um, I find that, that that's often the case that there's pastorally, there's something awry and um, it takes a while to get to what's, what's awry sometimes. But um, so that's, that's an important thing to remember um, that there's just often there's something behind the curtain that we just don't know yet. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's really good. I um, kind of related to that. I have sometimes used the language of um, trying to avoid a culture of suspicion, yeah. meaning, meaning that like, let's not, let's not just have by default, this assumption in church life that there's always something behind the curtain that I know what's really going on. Exactly right. I, the amount of just silliness and gossip through the years on that issue, know. you know, and there are habitual offenders I have found for this. That's right. And I'm now going to list their names. <laughs> <That's> um, <right. laughs> and then we're going to take this recording and send it out to all my friends. There are people because of their backgrounds or whatever seem to be predisposed to some of this stuff for whatever yeah. reason. Yeah. Um, Totally agree. Totally agree. And I think that, you know, 
it's interesting. Once I name culture of suspicion uh, here, I, I think sometimes people have remember that language and when they when they see it playing out they're like ah yeah, yeah. it's but that just seems healthy because then they can identify when it's playing out yeah. and um sometimes i like think of like the kind of healthy antibodies kind of moving in and around like yeah. the area of unhealth uh there can be that effect when it works well it it yeah. doesn't always but that's right but i but i have seen that work well um, yeah. and that's kind of like where I feel like, wow, I just watched a kingdom advancement right there. Yeah, exactly. You know, you know I, <laughs> you made me think of us. We all have stories. Yeah. And so, yeah. um, uh, you know, we had been in a, in a one year, we were in a real budget crunch and, um, this is another church that won't be named, but we were in a real budget crunch. And, uh, so uh, for whatever reason, you know, it was a communion Sunday and whoever was, um, the communion team bought a different kind of grape juice. Yeah. And um, it tasted, it looked different. It tasted a little different. Yeah, we're um, veering from the Welch's. Yeah, that's right. So um, at the end of the service, someone's like, oh, that tasted different. Well, you know, they're watering down the grape juice to save money. <laughs> and I just about, it was at the Narthex, and I just about busted a gasket. Yeah. You know, I thought, really? We're yes. going to water down the grape juice because we're right. going to save 17 cents. And right. so, of course, I didn't say that, but I'm like, no, I said, the new communion team, they accidentally bought the wrong juice. Oh, yes. okay. So I'm just yep. thinking that culture yep. of suspicion. Yes. That one little change comes in and it's like an honest mistake was made and it becomes this. And it, what it does is it sort of releases and gives gives avenue for that person's anxiety to be expressed, right? Yep. Um, and it's like, no, it, it's just, yeah. You know, what's, what's fascinating. And this is juicy like, juice. It wasn't Welch's. Yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> where, um, uh, where this stuff is like, can be really toxic is that then that could turn into a whole narrative if you don't check it. That's and right. Sometimes checking it doesn't need to be like, well, we need to sit in my office and we're going to have an hour long coffee over why this is not biblical or so yeah. you just kept it in check. You just said, no, that's not the story. Yeah. And yeah. and even by saying it there, were there other people? Pre was anyone else there? Was there oh, like yeah. 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 There are three or four other people. So around. It's not even like an isolated. It's just like you just in the midst of like some people. Yeah. It's like, yep, that's not it. And you set the record straight and move yeah. on. I, but yeah. I think to leave it go unchecked because a real conflict avoider would say uh, almost kind of shy away from even like speaking into that yeah. and let the person's angst kind of own the room and sure. i do think that there's a certain finesse in uh in being a pastor that is called for in those kind of ways that yeah. I, that frankly i think you only do learn through the through the years yeah you learn it by getting burned once yes um, and once you're burned <laughs> right. you don't do it again you don't do it again you don't do it again let me uh let me uh yeah, we, let me ask a few just kind of questions i i um uh poison like the poison pen letters uh yeah. that's one thing that comes up sometimes in church life boom 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 that is a nice thing about email i usually know who it's coming from yeah. although i have had people set up the anonymous the the the, the really? joke, yeah i've had people set up a joke email account so then they can send me something um uh you know kind of anonymously yeah. via email it you know be in front of me um which is funny like if you're gonna do that yeah. Future suggestion. Don't use your grandmother's name. <laughs> that's easy to find out. I'm just that's saying, right. you know who you are. Out there. You know who you are. I'm sure you're watching this video. Um, sure. But poison pen. Let, do you read them? Do you chuck them in the gar? I've heard it kind of all over the place. Do you when you get an anonymous letter? Yeah. Do you read it? You chuck it in the garbage? How do you generally do something? So like I that? save them. Um, I read them. Yep. Because someone's concerned enough to write. Um, they weren't brave enough to use their own name, but yep. um, they were concerned enough to write. And yep. often what I do is I will take that. I'll read it. I'll be angry about it yep. for a day or so. And then I'll go to a trusted person and say, read this and tell me what you think. Yeah, Because it's anonymous. Nobody, I don't know who it is. They don't know who it is. Yep. And um, generally they'll say, yeah, maybe they have some sort of strange point. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but oftentimes it's just someone who's mad about something 
that rub them the wrong way. So I, yeah. I keep a, I have two shoe boxes I keep yeah. in my cupboard at the church. And one is those letters that you get where people are thankful and grateful and yeah. you did this. And my mother's service was wonderful. And you save those because when you get those letters, the anonymous letters, you got to go into the good letters and read them and remind yourself that you're actually a pretty decent pastor. Yes. Um, and so That's good. I, I say, I just keep them. Um, I really don't put a whole lot of value into them unless I get other feedback from my trusted folks that I share it with. Your truth tellers. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's great. I do about the same thing. I mean, I've worked with people who are like, no, I just throw them right in the garbage. As soon as I know, I'm in the garbage. And I think like, yeah, I I, I guess I want to, I don't want to get any of them. I, like, yeah. you know, I mean, if I could turn that spigot off entirely, I would. Yeah. But, um, but they come from time to time. Yeah uh usually read them yeah i can feel my just adrenaline going even I, as i'm reading it i no, mean it's, sure. like, it's got like a, a physiological kind of thing that happens oh yeah absolutely I'm there reading it I'm like Ugh. but but <laughs> when i can set it down and get some perspective i've tried to get better at this through the years is there is there a nugget of truth in this yeah there may not be but is there yeah. And I should never feel like I am so got it all figured out that I shouldn't yeah. beg that question. Again, many times there's not. It's just someone teeing off in a way they don't have the courage and the backbone to come and chat with me. Yeah. Meanwhile, I don't know. I mean, people, I, I, I think generally when I have those conversations, uh, I handle them lovingly and with grace. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to lean into. I'm sure yeah. I fumble that from time to time. But yeah. I try and lean in that direction when somebody yeah. actually does muster up the courage to come yeah. and talk about something. Hard. Yeah. Cause yeah. that seems like that's how we just ought to do one yeah. another in church life. Um, yeah. but and so much of it comes, so much of dealing with conflict comes down being, you know, to use uh, family systems sort of thinking is to be a differentiated person. Yeah. Um, to not allow someone's anxiety to ramp up your own anxiety. Yep. And to be able to listen calmly and understand and maybe yep. not understand right away, to be quite frank. Um, and so that took a, a while for me to get to that point and um, sort of realize that, you know, I, I, I tell every church I've been in, I said, look, I'm going to make some, I'll say some dumb things. I'll probably make some really dumb decisions too along the way. But everything that I try to do, I try to do for the benefit of the church, not for myself, yep not for whomever i'm trying to do what's long-term best for the congregation something that will hopefully be good even after i'm long gone yeah and do i always do that no but that's my, certainly my intention and so and i make that very clear in the first couple of years i'm in the church and and um and i think people respect that um it doesn't mean you don't do dumb stuff and say things you regret and have to yeah, for apologize for but um, you know, I think being being confident in your calling, confident in the Lord, and confident in that, you know, I'm doing my best to honor God in my work, in the decisions that I make, in how I function as a pastor. Um, that that's kind of how I do that's kind of like the foundation piece. Is this, you know, my identity is in Jesus, my identity is not in pleasing people. Um and so that means there will be, con you're not going to avoid it. There will be conflict. And so um, just trying to realize it's not, um, I can't get ramped up by other people's anxieties and fears. And, um, I, you know, you have to be that differentiated person. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's good. Uh, a couple of things I was uh, just thinking here, maybe we'll start pulling things to a close. Yeah, we got to start um, wrapping up here probably. A few uh, a few things here that uh, uh, that I have tried to do is kind of just like one-offs here. Um, I've uh, used the language of frustration demands conversation. That mm. seems to be a helpful thing for people to just, and I have just banged away at that I phrase. Like that. I yeah. like when I hear a staff member here saying that because it's yeah. like, it's just it, it prompts them to kind of have to yeah. ask the question. Am I it, I'm feeling frustrated about something? We'll go talk to the person. Go, yeah. like, yeah. just get it, get it kind of worked out. Uh, from time to time, I'll have a staff member will come in, say, hey, uh, did you hear about blah, blah, blah? I'm like, you're in the wrong office. You need to be <laughs> down. 
you need to be down the hall. Yeah. I love you. And I wouldn't tell you this, but this is how we maintain health in our relationships yeah. and on the team. Good and for you. Uh, try that frustration demands conversation. Uh, I do this one churchwide uh, too, which is we don't talk in anonymity. I yeah. just, I, I am done playing the game. I years ago people are like, saying, yeah, I, you know, I heard a few people, what are their names? And if you yeah. don't trust me as your pastor enough to give me their names, we're not talking about it. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not going to like malign them. Yeah. On social media or something like I'm not going <laughs> after them, yeah. but without knowing who it is, I can't appropriate where it fits in the larger order of church life. Yeah. If, if by, I heard people saying, you mean like you stood in the mirror in your bathroom and spoke it out loud and that now <laughs> constitutes people or your spouse yeah, or your spouse. Right. Like that doesn't, you know, unless you can give me names, we, yeah. don't, we don't talk in just, uh, in vague, you know, kind of terms. generalities. Yeah. In generalities. That's, I that's, really, I mean, we know we we've, we've all had those conversations, right. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, who is frustrated by this? Well, yeah, yeah there's generally no answer. Right. So, yeah, I really try and, uh, and kind of put people uh, on yeah. the spot with that. And Not easy to do. You got to learn how to do that stuff. You got to learn how to do it. But um, but the more like I can do it. Yeah. Uh, when I started doing like a conversation like that, it was it felt pretty like it felt uncomfortably direct at people. They're like, because uh, because we excuse stuff like that in church life all over the place. Yeah. Through the years, I think I've gotten a little softer approach almost to do it in a way where they can almost kind of laugh because they kind of know they're caught doing the thing. Yeah. Um, but it's taken a while to get there because early on, I was just frustrated by it. And I'm sure that was coming through and how I would kind of call it onto the carpet. I've gotten better at it, I think. Um, so, well, yeah. Uh, yeah, that kind of- And we went a little up. longer than we thought. Yeah, we went a little longer than we thought. Sorry. Um, <laughs> you can right. just email your complaints to Pittsburgh Seminary. Um, <laughs> Carolyn Cranston. She'd be Carolyn, happy yeah. Um, yeah, dude, always good being with you. Um, hey, appreciate, appreciate you, Mark. Yeah, appreciate you too. Let me just offer up uh, some closing encouragement. Uh, if yeah. you're somebody who joined us here today, uh, I would want you to go away here in a couple of things. One, it, if you're dealing with conflict, you're not alone in it. Um, it, it is, yeah. it just, it, it happens. So hang in there with it. Um, keep up the good fight. Yeah. Uh, learn some lessons along the way. Seek to handle your conflict in a way that honors our Lord and somehow does advance the kingdom. Because when this stuff is handled well, yeah. I have watched this over and over and over again. When it's handled well, it's a kingdom advancing thing. When it's not, it tends to feel kind of like the reverse of that. So just handle it well. Um, it matters um, because it's one way that we somehow embody the gospel mm -hmm. in how we just handle conflict. I mean, yeah. in some manner, it seems to me there's something inherent in the gospel itself that is about conflict being yeah. handled well. Yeah. So keep at it, friends, wherever you yep. may be today. Amen. Whiteman, thankful for you. Can you, uh, you close us out with prayer? Sure, let's pray. Good and gracious God, we thank you for um, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you for our colleagues in ministry, for trusted friends along the way whom we can open up and share and ask hard questions and who are willing to tell us the truth, um, even when we don't want to hear the truth, maybe. Um, I thank you for Mark, Lord, whom I've known for 30 years now, at least, and um, for his ministry at, at Pleasant Hills and for the ministry here at First Covenant. Mm. Lord, uh, none of us likes conflict, um, but we know that when we handle it well, when we model how to handle it, um, our churches and we learn how to better deal with it again the next time it arises. And it's a kingdom advancing uh, moment. And so we're grateful for our time together. I hope that our words and our stories were helpful to somebody along the way. And uh, we give you, Lord, all the, all the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.